several countries who have signed up. So let's see. Um, we are still waiting for a couple of people. However, I would like, if you hear me, can you please just press yes or type yes in the chat box so I know that you can hear me. No? Okay, let's start. I'm not sure if there's anything wrong here. Let me, I'll just give it another minute or two. On the left side of your screen, there should be a small chat box. If you can see it, and if you can hear me, please type yes. Okay, great, great. So you can hear me. Perfect. So first of all, thank you for being here. Welcome to this evening's webinar about hypno-parenting. What an exciting theme, what an exciting topic, and uh, you'll see why it's so exciting for me in a minute. So just if you want to type just uh, your name, where you're from, uh, I can see people are coming in slowly, slowly. So let's keep this for a bit later. So Abir is here. Yes, that's great. Um, let me start by explaining what hypnoparenting is until more people come in. So, hello, Karin. Very nice to see you here. And uh, George, hello, hello. So, let me explain to you why hypnoparenting. Maybe you have read on the Facebook ads. Why is it that I'm offering this? You know, I'm a hypnotherapy instructor and a lot of times people take the course and at the end of the course they say, wow, I learned so much from my private life, from my personal life. Um, a lot of people who actually take my trainings, they don't use it as therapists. They don't use it to work with clients, but they love it for their own children. Do you actually know how much we influence and affect our children or not even our friends, our parents, our family members. Do you know how much we affect them just by talking? Do you know how much a word or a look or any, any behavior can affect people around us? And children even more because people children are actually still living in a world where they are absorbing. It's like a sponge. When they're born, they have nothing. They're, 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 they're no experiences. And they just absorb all this information. And also they absorb what we've been telling them and what we tell them. So let's start by a very, very short exercise for you tonight. I want to give you, I want to pump you up with things that you can actually start using with your children now. But before doing that, you have to experience it. Before doing that, you actually have to know what it is about. So I'd like you to just close your eyes for just a moment. There is the word hypno in there, so there will be some hypnosis involved. So just close your eyes for a moment. And take a deep breath. And I'd like you now to imagine, just imagine a place, a time, and imagine someone with you or not, where you didn't feel very comfortable. A time where you maybe were sad or angry. And don't, please, for now, don't choose a very traumatic event. Just a time and place where you felt a little bit annoyed, disturbed, and see yourself there. As you're there, as you're imagining it, 
Look around you and make yourself aware of the environment around you. And hear the words that were spoken, if there were any spoken. Hear the sounds, smell the smells and feel what you felt. And now I'd like you to open your eyes and just, if you want to type in, what did you feel? Any emotion, any feeling, please just type it in in the chat box. You could have felt something emotional. You could have felt sadness. You could have felt it physically. Many people describe, when I do this exercise, they describe they feel a mm, something in their stomach or I get anxiety. Yes. Uh, some people feel their hands or their palms get sweaty. Some people feel heart palpitations. So sometimes you feel it, I feel curious, headache. Okay, so there are a lot of things that you felt right now. Well, I told you to see an experience that wasn't very nice. So just for the sake of getting you back into a very, very good mood, I'd like you to close your eyes one more time. And take another deep, deep breath. And now this time, just imagine a place, a time, a moment in your life. You can remember, it can be a memory or an imagination, where you felt wonderful. A time, a place, either alone or with someone, where you're happy, relaxed, excited, anything you choose. And again, Make yourself aware of the environment. Hear the words that were spoken, if there were any. Smell the smells. You might have a small smile on your lips. Feel that. And feel what you felt. And absorb all of those wonderful feelings and open your eyes again and feel. What are you feeling now? Let me know, was there a difference between the first time and the second time? And what did you feel now? So much lightness, my heart opened. Very nice, Karin. Blissfulness, very nice. Free, very nice. I read so wonderful comments. Nice emotions, free, blissful, lightness. Aren't those nice? There's a quote from Albert Einstein here. In, if you see my presentation, logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. Why is this so important to know? And why is this important to know when we work with our children, actually? Because we are dealing here with hypnosis. What is hypnosis? And I'll make it very short. Hypnosis is actually a state, it could, we could describe it as a state of focused attention. We could describe it as a state in which the conscious mind is distracted. So what actually happens when we are in a state of hypnosis? Our conscious mind is distracted. Our conscious mind is not here with us. It's somewhere else. Like what just happened to you right now. You were somewhere else. So you are not consciously, logically, rationally involved in where you are right now. So you distracted your conscious mind. And then, when the conscious mind is distracted, anything can happen. When we are focused and when we have our attention on what we are doing right now, the thing is, we're not feeling. We're rationalizing. We have, we're analyzing. And when we do this, welcome to Ajamo. Welcome. Um, so when we do this, we are actually feeling, 
what, uh, sorry, we are actually thinking. And I like to say when we think, we don't feel. When we feel, we don't think. Okay? So just for a moment, imagine that thought. You are focused on something that you're doing. And you're focused on something that you maybe don't want to do, like don't want to smoke. So that moment, you're looking at that cigarette and saying, no, I don't want it. That's a habit that is ruling you, that is stronger than you. But the moment you actually focus on it and you say, no, I don't want it, you can stop. But the moment you distract your conscious mind, the moment you start doing something else and maybe having guests and enjoying yourself, whoops, your hands go automatically to that pack and you take it again. Why? Because that's your subconscious mind. And your subconscious mind is driven by emotions, not by rational and analytical thinking. So what I like to say is, when you think, you don't feel. When you feel, you don't think. Your subconscious mind, as we just saw in that small exercise that we did before, doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. So when I told you to go and think of something that was actually not so nice, you actually felt it. You even felt it in your body. And when I told you to think of something and to imagine things that are nice and wonderful, you actually also felt it. So what does this have to do with children? Well, children up to the age of about six don't rationalize. They don't analyze. They are actually living in the subconscious mind. Imagine now a child, and I have a whole list here, playing, studying, fighting. Look at those emotions and look at those faces that are there. That's what children are often in. They're often either sad, happy, excited. Look at those faces. And they play it. They act it. They pretend they are really that. So the thing is, when they are in, in an emotional state, when they are in that state where they actually feel all those emotions, they are actually living in the subconscious mind. And guess what? Why, why they are in the subconscious mind? They're absorbing everything like a sponge that's happening around them. They're absorbing the words we say to them. They're absorbing the looks we give them, the behavior that we have around them. And not only us, of course, also their friends, their, their teachers, everything that's going on around them. So why is this so important to know? Children are in there almost all the time. Of course, as they grow older, they get more into a, a conscious state. They get more into the place where they sit in school and have to study, have to learn. However, how many times have you seen a child daydream, even in school? While they're daydreaming, they are actually experiencing exactly what we experienced before. They are not there. They are not sitting there. Uh, Karin is saying the voice is off. Um, everyone else can hear me. Can you just type in yes if you can still hear me? I hope the technical problem is not from my side. Normal? Okay. Karin, it might be your... Pro your um, Your technical Etsy, okay. Let's, I'll, I'll just continue and I hope you can catch up again. Okay, so children, let me take voice is fine, okay, perfect. Let me take um, an example of what you see here now. The more emotional a child is, the more the words that we say actually stick. Now, here is a very good example of what we do constantly with children. So you can see that boy with a knee that he hurt himself. And the, so now there are two options. There are two things that we could do. We could approach that child and that knee and say, oh, my God, oh, you have a small boo-boo. And oh, I hope that doesn't work. Shall we go to the hospital and see what, what's wrong? Or, or let's put something and just lay down and it'll hurt. Or... So what, what, before we go to the or, what do you think 
goes on in the mind of that child. He is already emotional because he fell down and he is either sad or hurt or angry because someone pushed him. What is happens? So he is already in that emotional state. So the words that we say now to him are words that will actually whoom, go to just just might it happens now I, oh, you know what that looks really very very good nothing really happens and we could you know how sometimes mothers do like give a kiss on a knee and then I'd say I blow it away and everything's fine what happens to their faces they usually sin and go about doing whatever they did Okay, so that brings me now to, again, imagination and perception. So how can we as parents, how can you as parents actually deal with your child? How can you talk to him? What can you do? Now, perception is a very, very big word. Perception is something that is really, really important in our lives because everything is about perception. Everything is how do we perceive what's happening around us. So let me tell you a story about a small girl. So imagine a small girl that you see here goes to the mall with her mother and after doing two hours of shopping and eating cake and enjoying herself, suddenly she's standing there and all of these are passing by and she's looking and, where's mommy? Mommy's gone. What goes on in her mind? So that little girl starts getting scared more and more. And the more she looks around, the more that emotion grows and the more scared she is. After five minutes, her mother comes back and finds her. Those five minutes affected her and as I say, they would have sat and stuck in her mind. So her mother comes back and she starts crying and starts saying, Mommy, where did you go? So then when she goes home or goes to kindergarten the next day, and when people ask her, what did you do in the mall? What will she say? She will exactly tell the story of those five minutes. So everything else, the two hours, will be gone. Now let's pretend the same situation happens again. The girl is in the mall with her mother and they enjoy themselves. And after two hours of shopping, again, the girl looks around and mommy is gone. But in this moment, someone comes to her and tells her, you know what, I'm assuring you, that after five minutes only, mommy will be back. Will her fear be as big? Probably not. She will sit there and she knows what's going to happen. She knows that the end is good. She knows about the happy ending. So now she will just sit there and wait. And when her mommy comes back, she'll say, where did you go? And then she'll say, we still didn't go to that shop. I want to buy that dress. And when she goes home, she'll tell the people about the nice things that happened. So why is that? What was the difference between the first story and the second story? It was exactly the same scenario. The only thing that changed was her perception about what is actually happening and about the ending. So her perception changed and in the first scenario, the fear overtook because she was imagining what would happen if her mother never found her. In the second scenario, she could sit back and enjoy whatever she was doing and there was no imagination, there were no thoughts about what would come later. Thoughts that affect us are thoughts that we have about the future, often. 
So studies have shown that, sorry, so studies have shown that negative sticks more than positive. And let me tell you what a uh, study did. They had a group of people and they told the people, half of the people, 50% of the people, they told them it was about, about the surgery being done. And they told them that uh, this surgery has a 70% success rate. The other half of the group, they told that this surgery had a 30% failure rate. We're actually saying the same. What do you think to be happy with that procedure? Type if you want to. Obviously, group one. So group one, who heard that 70% success rate, was obviously more excited about it than the other group that heard 30% failure rates. Now, the interesting thing is, the group that was told 70% success rates, we then told them that, of course, if you have a 70% success rate, of course you will still have a 30% failure. What do you think happened from their positive reaction? Whoops, it turned into negative. Now, the other group that was told you have a 30% failure chance, again, they went there and told them, well, you know, if you have a 30% chance of failure, you also have a 70% chance of success. What do you think happened to that group? Guess what? It stayed. It stayed negative. That means, and there were a series of tests done in the same way. I will not go into them now because we don't have the time in an hour. So what, what does that mean? That means that the negative sticks more than the positive. That means that a negative thought, even if it reverts in a positive, it will still, the negative will still stick more. And even a positive with a negative added to it will turn into negative. So what does that mean for our children? And let's get into some work now. Let's get, and I, I, I told you, or I wrote, that this course is actually for parents, but you will get a lot of what we actually do in a hypnosis session, what actual hypnotherapists do. You will not be certified and you will not be allowed to use it as, um, you know, as therapists. However, you can use it and trust me, you can have so many results, so much good results with it. So, First thing, we talk about suggestions. What are suggestions? We use suggestions a lot in hypnosis. Suggestions are, if you ever heard a recording, a hypnosis recording, YouTube is full of them. You will hear, put you into a, what we call a trance, which is actually just that world of imagination, that, that state of hypnosis, which is a state of relaxation or imagination. And then you will be bombarded with suggestions. Why do we bombard with suggestions? Because we have to repeat them and repeat them and repeat them and repeat them. With every repetition, they become more and more reinforced. So we have several ways of using subject suggestion. A direct suggestion would be just telling the child you are great. You look good. You are actually really good in school. Wow, you managed to climb up there. That's great. So we're actually telling that child that he is good. That's a very direct suggestion, that he can do things. 
An indirect suggestion would be not telling it directly, but saying it as a story or a metaphor. So we are telling that child how I went to school, for example, and that teacher told, your teacher told me how much fun she had in class yesterday. And she was telling me about all of these children, how one child And the other child drew an even more accurate picture of it. And how then she discovered that there was actually one painting that was wow, and she didn't find the name at first. And then she saw your name on there. So this is a whole story related to something. So we are building up the emotion. We're building up that story. We are actually building up and using the imaginate child. Because when we start telling stories, the child goes at imagination. The, the child imagines what we're saying. The, the pictures start forming in their brain. And guess what? What we said before, then they are in a state of hypnosis. So when they are there, they're actually absorbed, we're saying. Now, of course, we have to just be aware of our language. We have to be aware of what positive affirmations, what positive suggestions we are giving. Now, another way of indirect suggestion, what we are doing all the time, actually, is our visual suggestions. So our body language is already a suggestion. So what happens if I come up to a child and smile? That's already a suggestion on its own. What happens? When I come from work because I'm stressed or because I had, a, uh, I had traffic or I had a fight with my boss or with my husband and I come to my child because I want to give him food and I'm coming with that angry face, well, that's a suggestion too. And the child has no idea why. But the mere face expression that I have is already enough to suggest, uh-oh, something is wrong. So when I suggest something is wrong, what's going on in the mind of the child? The imaginative mind. The imagination starts forming pictures, starts forming thoughts. And the imagination of a child, wow, can go wild. So that child might imagine things that might go wrong that have nothing to do, neither with the child nor with me, maybe. Maybe it was just that traffic jam. So beware of your visual um, expressions. Beware of your, your body language. Beware of what you show the child. Also, the tone can be the auditory suggestions are really important. The way I talk, how I raise my voice or lower my voice. If I'm shouting, if I'm whispering, or if I'm smiling and talking because they can hear that. So whatever expression I have in the tone of my voice is also so important. Now, um, there, there are, um, just by raising the voice on one letter or on one word, we can change the meaning of a whole sentence. Children pick up on that. Adults pick up on that. We all pick up on that. Words are actually the least that affect us in language. So if we would see the, um, if we would uh, divide our language into words, body language and tonality or tone, words only account for 7%. The tone is really, really important. So I will give you one sentence and I'd, li and I'd 
put that sentence in several contexts or, or put an um, uh, emphasis. And I'd like you to just hear the difference, okay? So here's my child, and there's another child who said, oh, he took away my, my phone, because they all have phones now, right? So I could say, he didn't say you took his phone. I could say, he didn't say you took his phone. I can say he didn't say you took his phone. I can say he didn't say you took his phone. 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 So you see that sentence. Each time it had another meaning because of the tone. So how important is that when we accuse our children of having done something? Just think about it. Repeat and repetition is something that is really important. And why is it really important? Because repetition becomes habits. So what are habits actually? We actually say a habit is something like smoking, something like drinking, something like gambling, something like nail biting could be a habit. But what about, for example, a fear? A fear is also a habit. A fear starts with something that we have learned in our past. And let me tell you a story again. Let's say you're outside and your mother goes for a walk with you and you're only six months old. And there is a dog that passes by. And your mother, just to protect you or because she's afraid or just because she's, you know, surprised, she just takes you, picks you up and does, <gasps> does this. In that moment, you have an association, and that's how our mind works. We associate that, f that dog with that feeling of <gasps> surprise or fear, whatever it is. Now, that's a small, small feeling. It's not a fear yet. However, over the course of the years, with every time you see a dog, every time you go back, that feeling of, oops, beware, 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 becomes stronger and stronger. Why? Because we get better and better at what we do. The same applies to habits. We get better and better at them. We get better and better at being scared of something. The same applies to feelings, to emotions. So what if my child learns in very, very young age, at a very, very young age, that he's not good. He's not good enough. Someone is better than him. What if I keep saying to him, look at your sister, she's much better. And every time he hears that, that feeling gets repeated and repeated and repeated. And that feeling or that emotion will get stronger and stronger. And guess what? This is also a habit. So that child will actually get better and better at actually thinking and believing that he's not good enough. So a habit starts as an anchor between a situation between something that happens, something that they see or hear or feel or smell, and an emotion. So we can be in a, in a room, in an environment, and feel sad because of something that happened. 
but maybe we associate that with that person telling us that story. Maybe we associate it with the place we're in. We associate situations that we were in with people a lot of times without knowing it, with places without knowing it. This is what we call an anchor. And every time we see that person or we see that color or we see that place, we automatically go back and feel that feeling without knowing why. So like I said before, with repetition and repetition and reinforcement, habits become stronger and stronger. And we get better and better at them. And they become automatic. So going back to a suggestion, going back and knowing how important it is what we actually say to that child. Here's an exercise that you can do over and over again. Knowing that with repetition, the words that you say to your child will stick more and more. And knowing that the negative will stick more than the positive, that means that you have to dominate, that you have to overpower them with the positive. Or just start positively. If your child is young, if you're still starting off, if there's not, not a lot of negativity already in there. You can just start by, for example, just telling your child that you love them no matter what. You see, a lot of times, love is conditioned or conditionally attached to something. So have you ever heard a mother say, Finish your, your, your plates. Do this for mommy so that mommy loves you. Okay? Or if you get that good grade, then mommy will love you really, really more or a lot. A lot of times we attach or we give love in return for being perfect, being good in school, finishing food. So here's an exercise of just telling them that they are okay the way they are, that they are loved the way they are. Love is a very strong emotion and when they feel it and when we combine it with suggestions, so we have the smile, we have the visual, we might have a kinesthetic that means a, ki a feeling, a touch and at the same time we look at them, we have that voice where we emphasize on how much we love them. And we can do it regardless of if they bring home a good grade or not. At the same time, we're giving them suggestions. We're giving them suggestions that they are actually perfect, that they can actually do it, that they are capable of passing that test, that they are capable of uh, getting into that football team. Well, what we do often is, and I'd like you now to just go back to your habits, your own habits. We often have habits that are passed down from generations generations that are or, or just family maybe it's not our generation maybe it's your partners your husbands your wives maybe it's something that is just become a habit in the family maybe it's a habit of shouting maybe it's a habit of questioning maybe it's a habit of being sarcastic of ridiculing someone and most of the time, that person is not even meant. This child is not even meant. Most of the time, it is really a habit. And I'm sure you know people who mm, tend to have that, that sarcasm in their voice, in their way of talking. 
Now, when you do this with children, guess what? They are affected because they see and feel what you say. They don't have that rational mind if the child is small enough. They don't have the rational mind of knowing, oh, this is sarcasm. They will just absorb it and it will affect them. So all of this sarcasm, joking, joking around with, with children is not really helping build up confidence, build up the feeling of self-esteem. Sometimes we have the habit, um, especially in countries in the Middle East, if you're from the Middle East, but any, actually anywhere in the world, we have the habit of wanting to have that child be perfect in front of others. That image of my child is the best in school. Look at what she did. Look at what he did. That can actually be counterproductive. Because what I'm saying to everybody in front of that child is that my child is the best and that's the only thing I want to tell the people about that child. Children are put into a pressure, into a mode of, of being pressured when they hear things like this. Because of course they want to please their parents. They want to please the person that they love most. And if love and getting love means being the best in school, that means that's what I have to do. But now I'm not the best. Now I'm not the first in class. But my mother wants me to be the first in class. So I have that dilemma in, within me. So I have that feeling of not being good enough. Not being good enough so for the person who I love most. Because for the children, their parents are the closest they can get. Unless they grew up with their grandparents. But for children who grow up at home with their parents, Parents are the most important people, and they always, always want to please them. Um, again, another habit that might be um, in the, within the family is shame, blame. That's also a habit that can be so subconscious that you're not aware of it anymore as you grow up. So if, for example, a mother always blames someone, and this starts in school. This starts at a very young age when I say, oh, you know what? When I, when I tell people he got a bad grade, but he has a very, very bad teacher. What am I doing? I'm blaming the teacher. And it can become a habit to always find the fault in someone else. As we grow older, and we certainly all know people who actually talk like this, who blame others. Shame can also be learned from a mother, from a father. Guilt can also be a feeling that can be seen, learned, and modeled from a mother. So again, be aware of your own behavior. Be aware of your own habits at home around your children. Be aware of how you react when something happens. Because your child will learn from you. The result, if, I, if, if the result of blaming, the result of, of, of feeling guilty, the result of ridiculing, will often be, I'm not good enough. I'm not okay. And when I have that voice in me that is saying, I am not okay, that voice will keep repeating and repeating itself. And because it is a negative, and I told you earlier that negative stick, that voice will always find what is actually not okay in me. Because it is confirming to me that, yes, I knew it. And then that voice, that inner talk, that inner dialogue will, will actually 
ex um, we will hear it express them when children express themselves to the outside world and saying I can't do this I don't know how to do this so those world words of I cannot I I don't know those words result from a repetition and repetition of a feeling within the child that they are not good enough uh, there is a very nice book um, this is trans what we call transactional an analysis in psychology there is a very nice book called I am okay you're not okay if you read it you'll understand more that that feeling of I'm okay I'm not okay that feeling that adult that, that parent that tells you no you have to do this no this is not right no this is shameful that those things if they're accumulated and repeated a lot in a childhood that this will become the inner voice and that we will keep that parent in us that parent that will keep telling us what to do or what not to do so again very very important thing to actually know so here's another exercise for you and if you want your child to change tell them they're okay the way they are what do I mean by that often we tell them what to do in order to change well if you tell a child that he has to do something else to be loved to be good to be what you want them to be what does that translate into if I say I would love for you to dress differently because your clothes are horrible what does that mean translated to that child it means the way I am now I'm not okay so if you want them to change motivate them in what they are actually doing let them feel a feeling of um, self-esteem so if I tell that child that he is actually okay he will feel confident enough to then maybe talk about his clothes with me so we start by actually giving them the confidence that they are great that they're okay we get we start by giving them the confidence that they are okay even if they brought back home a, a grade that wasn't so good in school and when they have that confidence then we can start talking to them about ways of improving however they have to feel that they are okay so this is a very very this is really a biggie because we a lot of times tell the children this you have you have to change and that word you have to change always translates in I am not okay so as I said motivate them motivation has to come from inside they have to be motivated to do things and they can only be motivated if their inner world is happy if they have emotions that make them want to do something so what do you think what is better reward or punishment and what kind of reward and what kind of punishment when we punish a child and this is an exercise again that um, you have to deliberately do neither Karin yes perfect because it depends also on the situation right so it's we don't punish for something that they did we ex we try to understand what happened um, actually this is something that is a, a long topic but I will touch on it right here um, thank you Karine for that um, punishment is 
giving them the impression that they did something wrong again. Now, uh, there is in, in, um, we have a very, very important thing that we need to understand is that at every given moment, we do the best of our abilities with the resources that we have in that moment. Okay, repeat that for yourself. In every given moment, with the resources I have, I give and do the best of my abilities. And that applies to your children also. Because if I know better, if I had more resources in this minute now, I would do it. You see, this applies to children and to adults. Very important also for mothers, fathers also, of course, to know that because often a mother will feel guilty about having done something or said something in the past. Well, at that, in that moment and at that time, you didn't know any better. At that time, you did, was, which was the best of your abilities at that time. And that also applies to children. So if a child fights with his brother, with his friend, that means that in this moment, they don't know how to react differently. If a child brings back a grade that wasn't good enough for you, that means that at the, in this moment, he didn't know how to perform better. So by punishing him, we're actually putting, we're actually adding to his distress because he already knows that he didn't get a good grade. He's already sad about it. He's already angry about it. So he's already emotional. And when I punish him over that, I'm adding to the distress. And as we heard before, the more emotional a child is, the more those negative words will stick. And the more I will add to his belief maybe that, oh, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. So before starting to punish, before starting to shout, before starting to actually say something that you might regret later on, this exercise here is really important. Deliberately choose the emotional states you want to be in. Align yourself with it and then talk to your child. So don't let the subject at hand be the reason for choosing your emotional state. Meaning, if the child comes home with a bad grade and you get upset because you wanted him to be better at it, if something happened and your child is running because he has a friend over and they're running and the glass, whoops, tilts and falls and the glass breaks. Your first reaction might be shouting. Your first reaction might be anger. Your first reaction might be wanting to spank him. I don't know. So just refrain from doing that by taking a deep breath. And this also can become a habit, by the way. If you're now thinking, oh, I can't do this, it can become a very, very easy habit if you repeat it and repeat it. So deliberately choose your emotions. Choose your state of mind that you want to be in and align yourself with it. Feel it. Actually feel it. Like what we did at the beginning. When you actually are sitting here and we did it within one minute, you were able to swap from a sad or an anxious memory into a nice one. You are capable of doing that. So deliberately put yourself in a state where you are really, really, maybe a state of understanding, a state of compassion, and then talk to your child. Um, one thing that I would like to mention here in that short webinar is TVs and phones. So again, why am I mentioning that? Just to a thought for you. 
a lot of parents who say, no, 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 go off the TV, go off the phone, my, ch my child has the phone all the time in his hand. Well, again, it is not the phone that is bad. It is not the TV that is bad. I'd like you to think of that. It's the message that comes from the TV. It's the message that comes from the phone. And that's just as important as the messages that we are giving our children, the suggestions that we are giving our children. They also come from TV shows. They come from their favorite actors, from their favorite uh, cartoon figures. And they come from their friends who chat with them on their phones. So if you look at that picture here of that, of that boy, it's not the, the phone it, actually that is bad here. It is basically what he's, say, what he's seeing. He might be bored. Also, that feeling of boredom, that feeling that what comes out of the phone is not actually giving him something positive in that moment. Whereas if we see that picture, we can see that that girl is maybe getting a message from her father, who's on a business trip, or uh, her friend who sent her a picture of her new puppy that she got, or her mother who's in the hospital just and who just had her baby sister and he, she's sending her a picture of that baby sister. So whatever that is that is in that phone, it's not the phone that is bad or good, it's the message that comes across. And it's all about the messages that we give our children day in a day on a daily basis, whether it's what we say, whether it's how we behave, or whether it's messages that they get from devices like this. Another um, thing that I want to touch on, because I told you that we will be actually doing what hypnotherapists do, is an exercise that in therapy we call regression therapy. Now this sounds like, whoa, am I going to do regression therapy with my child? Well, guess what? Yes on a very, very simple level. And here's the exercise. Here's what you could actually do with your child. In therapy, we do it a little bit differently. However, it's the same concept. You remember that story that I told you earlier about the girl in the mall? Well, this is exactly what we do. We go back to that situation. We let the child go back and remember what happened. And while he remembers what happened, exactly like you did at the beginning, you imagine it, you feel it. And while you're feeling it, you're in that emotional state of hypnosis where you can absorb suggestions, where they actually stick. So you tell your child, well, go back to that situation that happened there where you were sad. And tell me what's going on. And they will tell you what happened in school. And then, while they're there, you bring that one person that changed the perception of that girl in the mall, you remember? And you will tell that girl that, you know, at that time, it's fine. You had a fight. You didn't know any better. But now you do. You will tell that child that at that moment, what happened, you are still smaller, younger, even if it was yesterday. Today you know better because today you're here telling me about it. So your, your older you knows what you didn't know yesterday. And guess what? When they imagine it, when they play role play, because children are great in role playing, when they do that, they can change the perception of the sadness or anger they felt. So that's the exercise of regression. We won't cover it more today. I, I, I will give you today a lot of exercises to do. However, in the full course, of course, you will go into it and we will practice it more. Exercises for suggestions are Always talk in the positives with your children. So, you know that famous uh, uh, sentence, don't think of a pink elephant? Oh, that pink elephant just popped up in my, into my mind. Why? Because our mind doesn't work with negatives. And how many times do we tell our child, don't do that? Don't jump. 
don't climb. Well, the don't is eliminated of the mind and they just hear the word jump, climb. So, suggestions are to be put in a positive way, not in a negative way. The second big thing I want you to really, really eliminate from your language is the word try. If we tell our child try to do something, they will only try to do it. So we can either do something or not do something. We cannot try. We also have to be aware of the word try, what we are telling our children, what we will do. If I want to do something for my child, I will do it. If I don't want to, I will say no. But I won't tell him, we'll try to go to that water park tomorrow. We'll try to make it. Because that already sets us up for failure. The third thing to be aware of when we, do so, when we suggest things to our children is to actually speak in the present tense. This might be a little bit strange to you, but if I say to my child, you know what, you will be a good sportsman, you will be a good football player one day. What picture did you just get? A picture of maybe one day I will be a good football player. However, if I speak in the present tense and I say you are a good football player just do it for yourself and sense and feel the difference now some people say I can't lie to myself I can't lie to my child I can't say I am a good football player if I'm not well you're also lying to yourself when you're talking about the future because you don't know what's coming in the future so if you want to lie lie in a positive way and say, I am. Because when you, also when you speak to yourself, but also to your child, because when you say, I am, when you tell that child you are, you are great, you are good, you are good in math, even if he brings back a 10% on his, on his um, test. If you tell him, I know you are good, you're motivating him from the inside, you're giving him that motivation, okay, I am good, so I can do it. Okay, so in the present tense, rather than saying, well, one day, when is that day coming? And the fourth thing that is a word, a magical word, especially for children, is the word imagine. So when you use suggestions, tell that child, well, imagine. Imagine yourself actually scoring that goal. There were a lot of uh, tests done um, in the medical field and in the motivational field, sports field, and I'll just mention one now here, uh, where a, a basketball team was told to actually imagine put, placing the ball in the net. And by repeating and be, by repeating and by repeating it, they actually uh, uh, became really, really uh, uh, good in, in, in what they were doing. Not because they practiced it, of course they also practiced it, but, also, but just by imagining it. Uh, another um, study was done um, where uh, uh, people were told to actually do a certain exercise with their thigh muscle. And so the group was divided into different categories and one group was actually told to do that exercise and the other group was told to imagine doing that exercise every day. Well, guess what? The two groups has had equal results because by imagining, like we did at the beginning, that exercise at the beginning was actually so uh, powerful to make you understand how our mind, when we imagine things, actually think it's reality. So that was where it's nine o'clock um, here in Dubai at least. Um, that was it for today. Now, please note all those exercises and start doing them because they are, if you know 
just what you know now already, if you know how powerful the mind is, if you've already understood how powerful our suggestions are, if you understood that once a child is in an emotional state, every word we say to him is important, and when you know how to word your words, how to use positives, then you already know, then you're basically almost already in the therapy. But if you want to go more, and if you want to learn more, I have a new course um, that is designed for parents. It is a course that is very similar to the actual hypnotherapy course that I teach professionals. However, this one is not certified by any bigger body. It's for you, for your own use for your use with your child. That, pair, that course will have, thing, will have all those topics, how to use waking hypnosis, how to have rapport with your child, how the suggestions affect us, and how to use suggestions, whether they're direct, whether they're indirect. How to create scripts for your child, scripts for nail biting, scripts for study habits, how to create goals with your child, how to find the positives in your child's life. We'll talk about one of my favorite topics, the RAS, the reticular activation system in the brain, that part of the brain that filters the positives or the negatives, more the negatives, and how to train that RAS to actually find the positives. We will talk about re the regression therapy. Um, we also will talk about something that is part of uh, hypnotherapy, which is parts therapy. And in a very playful way, you, I will teach you how to use it with your child. Uh, we will learn how to teach a child self-hypnosis. We will deal with illnesses, pain, fears, and phobias, and much more. That course is, of course, a course that is tailor-made for parents. That course will be for over the course of four weeks, twice a week, so you will have eight times two hours. In each hour, you will have one topic that we will practice in those hours, and then you will be free to practice it with your child. Now, the normal price and the normal fee that I, would, that I will charge for that course is $399, which is nothing compared to what hypnotherapists actually pay. For webinar attendees today and for people who are actually downloading and requested that webinar to be given to them, the price is only $299 for the eight times. So now I reached the end of the course. I will keep this up here and I will also put it in the chat. So for everybody who's interested in taking that course, go to mindyourpower.org slash hypnoparentingonlinecourse and you can register there or you can just send me an email or send me a message. Now, I'm opening it up. I know we went just overboard a little bit. Um, I'm opening up to questions. If anyone has a question, please type it in. Thank you, Karin. Anyone else has a question? Thank you also, Ajamu. I hope I'm pronouncing your um, word, your, your name right. Thank you, Abir, for being here. Any questions? Anyone who has a question? Okay. 
So I'm always uh, there for questions. If anyone has some questions, you can always message me or um, send me an email. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you for um, enjoying for your comments. And I hope to see you sometime in the very near future, all of you. Have a nice evening, day, wherever you are. And okay.